looking at the world now. That's got me insane. Thinking about checking out. Can't do it again. But I know just who I am. How strong I can be. Na 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 na. This country is yours and mine. It's the home of the brave and free. It's a place for you and me. Na 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 na. It's only a matter of time till we get things back on track. On track. Our values are under attack. Agents on my trail. The flag on Christmas Day, they'll throw you in jail. Sorry for the delay on the premium app. It should be out later today. We had, we had uh, some technical issues on our end, had to record this morning, but it will be out there tomorrow, or tonight, rather. So apologies for that. Ah, namaste, everybody. Hmm. So yeah, last I I I, uh, I teased something last week. I said I had an idea. I had a thing I wanted to say, I wanted to talk about next week, and I forgot what it is. And now I remember. And then as soon as we were done, I remembered what it was. Oh right. What happens when you die? Sorry for people who don't like the uh, goofy, esoteric, uh, speculative, theological episodes. This isn't going to be for you. But it's something I feel like I have to get out one way or the other. Because uh, I do feel like, for the first time in my life, I have a grasp for myself. Uh, like a, a, mo a working intuitive understanding of like how human consciousness uh responds to its uh its stimulus its inputs being removed i.e dying the thing that's uh been the the uh the sliver in my brain since i was a little kid i have I still have a distinct memory. One of my first real memories is of uh, looking up at a stat of a uh, crucified Jesus on the wall of a guest bedroom in my grandmother's house, and just thinking back. And I got like all kids do: you get to when you can't remember anymore, and then. The realization, like this cold feeling of "Oh God, if I can't, if I won't remember, if I don't remember before, then what about after?" Now, Mark Twain famously was said, "Hey, I didn't feel any pain or anything before, so why would I care about afterwards?" And you know that's true; it's incredibly true. But for the vast majority of my life, it did not do me any good because. All I could obsess about was the subjective experience of approaching that nothingness. That's a very bad way to live your life. I will say that. I do not recommend it to anyone. It, uh, it turned me into a fear-based creature. And uh, eventually a fucking uh, really obnoxious hypochondriac. Although, I guess it wasn't really hypochondria because... Apparently, to have hypochondria, you have to go to the doctor all the time. I never went to the doctor. I just thought about what was wrong with me and worried about it. And then uh, try to talk myself out of it logically. And that's how I would, like, that's how I would deal with the bad, the bad sensations that came with being in a human body, which are inevitable. Like, we're going to have bad and good sensations in our bodies as we live. That's what consciousness is really it is a little boat it's a little boat in the sea of uh, sensations and it gets rocked back and forth by ones uh that are 
considered subjectively as good feelings and as bad feelings. And they come from all over the place, and our brains interpret them. But our brains interpret them through a... Uh, uh, through a pall, through, through a veil. We can't really know why we feel anything because that level of uh, a perception is not narrativized. It's too far from our brains uh, because the, the brain is a uh, reacting mechanism. Consciousness is a reactive phenomenon. You get a stimuli, you don't think about it first, you feel it first. Then your brain turns it into something. Now, if it's an A to B situation where like, you uh, are cutting onions and you watch a knife cut your finger, that kind of sharp, instantaneous surface uh, feeling can be immediately tracked to a source, and then you react to that. And then the danger is dealt with. But you got a body, it's filled with stuff, and that stuff's moving around and bouncing off each other. It's just a big, uh, it's it's honestly a bunch of fluid. It's goo. It's a, you're just a bunch of goo. We're all, we are all, all our juices. And that means it's constantly in flux. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an inside ocean with the same fucking salinity level as seawater, not coincidentally, and it's bouncing around and it's making, it's echoing feelings all through you. But you don't know why. You can't perceive at that level of um, acuity uh, to the thing, one way or the other. So you have to figure out why you feel a certain way. As you try to chart that little boat on the ocean towards the good feelings and away from the bad feelings. And a human in a uh, healthy social organism uh, that process of steering the ship towards the good feelings and away from the bad feelings is uh, part of a social harmony that connects people within a society and those people to their biome, to their lived environment. Now, that doesn't mean there's not pain in life. Life is always going to be suffering and always going to be pain. And for people who were in those earlier, uh, more socially um, healthy organisms, life was largely pain, much more physical pain than we suffer in the, in the, in the, at the end of history, at the end of the technological uh, process, buoyed about in our little bubbles. I mean... Even people who are who struggle to make it every day in this country and, and suffer a lot of pain do not have to find their own supper. You know what I mean? Like that is a there there is an abstraction to uh, social reproduction and physical reproduction in 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 the West where we are. That uh, means that there's just a quant there's a there's a massive difference in the amount of day to day pain. Uh, that we experience now. But what we have replaced that pain with is a psychic spiritual pain that far, far, far outweighs any amount of physical pain felt by people in organized, in, in um, harmonious social organs. Because you're fighting with nature. You're fighting maybe with other people who are outside of your organism. And they are, uh, and that fight involves victories and losses and involves pain and suffering but it is conducted by everyone towards the same goal that means that what is good for me personally like the 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 desire to sit somewhere and feel a good thing tasting in your mouth or having a good sensation on uh, your your genitals like that stuff the stuff that's considered sinful by modern religions uh, that emerge out of the Abrahamic tradition that stuff is not socially um, alienating. It's socially 
rewarding because it's to everybody's benefit to have these feelings, to fight to allow everyone within the uh, the social organism to carry out that act, those acts. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't still conflict because we are all, every human psyche, because of that veil I talked about, doesn't really know what they want, what their body wants. They don't really know. They're only guessing. We're always only guessing because we're trying to cobble together after the fact a narrative of what is happening to us that is uh, unable to deal with the deepest connections, the deepest uh, point of contact between us and everything around us. And, and because of that lag, we're guessing. And in that guessing, we create unique psyches. We have with subconsciouses uh, and, and, and a conscious mind that has desires that are fueled and shaped by unconscious and unaccessible desires. So that's the, that's that I'm not saying everybody in, 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 in a tribal society or something is, is living this like a, uh, 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 Edenic experience. No, they are living regular lives filled with regular alienation and regular suffering. But the angle of their life, this is the important part, the trajectory of their life is towards dying in a way that allows them to, as their mind ends, and this is a thing we know scientifically happens, the mind towards the uh, cessation of, uh, of energy inputs looks backward. It's, it, 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 your brain lights up like a fucking casino and all of your deep, most deeply grooved memories are accessed. Uh, this, is, this, is not, this is not a spiritual uh, argument by me. This is just the science of what happens when you die. When an organism, a human organism, with a human brain dies, we know enough to know that's what happens. Now, what is that subjectively experienced as? I believe the only thing that makes sense is that the thing it is experienced as is you having the experiences of your life, and then they are weighed by yourself according to uh, whether or not in the moments that you're remembering you felt in some harmony with the world, therefore capable of surrendering back to it. As opposed to Wanting to either hang on to a feeling or, just as importantly, uh, deny, destroy, make even a feeling. So in a, in a society where uh, desires are organized socially... You can live a whole life of pain, suffering, joy, misery, alienation, introspection. And as it ends, though, that trajectory reveals itself. And what seemed maybe like just getting through the day becomes retrospectively to oneself a narrative of reconciliation. Because you are remembering, a, you are remembering a life and being brought to ease, and I mean this physically, as in a body carries with it a tension that defines consciousness. Like our consciousness is like a closed fist. Coming into consciousness as a human being is to have your brain close around certain things, because our brains have almost infinite capacity. We know that. You can get hit on the head and speak French, having never encountered it before. We know the brain has those capabilities. Because it has access to everything. Because it's emerging from a totalized single consciousness. But as you come into being and you encounter the rest of the world through echolocation and create a synthetic holographic representation of it, which is where the conscious mind resides, not in the real world, but in an agreed-upon, socially reproduced fiction.
So this is just a... But, but this possibility that I'm talking about of having your, uh, your, your, your mailed fist, right, the consciousness, because you're pulling away from p c capabilities and moving towards certain other capabilities. You're dropping the ability to access your brain to do one thing so that it can do a different thing better. That is a conscious, always conscious, but below active conscious process. We are always keeping ourselves clenched around a certain understanding of the world. Wilhelm Reich talks about this. This is what he calls armoring. And when we encounter death, we encounter full and total relaxation back towards that original state of totalized consciousness. If we encounter that subjectively with our bodies relaxed due to our belief in it, which is something that we accumulate by looking backward and telling ourselves a story that ends with us reunited, having spent a life reconciling ourselves towards others and the world. Even if you're fighting, you know, over a, over a dead uh, caribou and, and you end up with a fucking spear in your gut, even though if you die alone like Utsi the Iceman, Whatever your uh, cultural programming has uh, a s structured below your consciousness to represent reality will meet you. It will rise to meet you. And I think it happens to everybody no matter what. What happens when you have fixed class-based societies, the ones that emerge, uh, not coincidentally around the same time that the first uh, relig uh, textually based religious traditions emerge. And you go from a system of cyclical accumulations of, uh, of social hierarchy that, event that is are understood to be temporary to one where they're understood to be permanent. And that's where you get Buddha, that's where you get Confucius, that first wave uh, of, of uh, self-conscious attempts to structure our understanding of living in a totality that is socially alienated. Instead of living in a, in, in a uh, consciousness boat that has everybody within your society in it, which is what you have in a, in a tribal order, in a fixed agricultural society with, with, uh, consist, with uh, persistent class rule, all of a sudden you have a social organism you're still part of. You still have that notion of it as a thing that you are uh, enmeshed within and also and what which interests you share, but it's all sustained by a inherently antagonistic relationship with other people who are allegedly inside the boat. You go from everybody on one boat to classes uh, stratified on, a, on on a boat with 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 the inevitable uh, social alienation caused by that, which means you go from a situation. When the body coming into con the human body coming into consciousness is a process of gathering oneself into an armored state over the course of the first uh, eighteen so years of of life when when you're being when you're literally growing into something and around something a social understanding then you have the plateau period from your 20s, 30s, 40s, when you before your free testosterone starts going away, if you're a guy, uh, or your fertility goes away if you're a woman, to carry out, to live according to the mapping you've gotten in that first era. Then, again, in a socially, uh, in a healthy social body that provides a basic level of personal day-to-day -day security and like le and and uh, and consistent the important thing is consistent comfort and also has a holistic social order then the rest of your years as you know the the energy departs your body literally as the chi that powered you through your earlier years starts to to desert you you spend that time de-armoring. 
every day uncalcifying because you're not out there fighting all the time. You're not doing the stressful, uh, intense work of building and maintaining a society. You are able to enjoy its benefits and, and you are able to be proud of your contribution to it. And the other people around you treat you with respect and, and deference because of your role. And so as you near death, you literally relax yourself into being able to accept it. Now, you might die earlier, but you're going to be dying in some sort of conflict where the fight that you're doing consecrates your death. Because that's the thing. You die violently in your prime, horrible, terrifying, but... At a certain point, you stop feeling pain, right? The body starts, stops perceiving uh, pain and starts perceiving whatever it wants. But what it wants is dictated by a bodily uh, posture that we're not consciously in control of. But once you get fixed social structures around class society perpetuating itself, you have people coming into an armoring, then doing a bunch of work as an adult, and then coming to uh, the end of that in the decline phase. But at every point, once they have, uh, at every point in that map, instead of being trained into a social harmony and then able to act willingly out of a desire, a loving desire to hold up your social structure, you are trained to work against yourself one way or the other. If you are on the bottom end, it is to labor for someone else. And if it's on the bottom end, it is to uh, indulge oneself on the work of others, who you recognize as equal to you. Not, not in some sort of sense of they're as good as I am, in, metaphysically. I mean, they have two arms, they have muscles, they have eyes, they have basic reasoning skills, they have the ability to communicate with each other, meaning, even if I don't think they're humans, I think that they can show up one day and cut my fucking throat. And then you live your plateau years battered away from ever being able to uh, assert love in your in your uh, labors. Infuse love into the experience, the, remem the memory of doing a life of labor. You're not building your own house. You're building somebody else's house. Or you're having somebody else's, somebody else's building your house. And you're sitting there. Either way, the time spent is alienated, which means that when you're on the down slope, if you get there, first of all, if you die uh, before that, you have your labors were in vain. But if you get to decline, even if you get to relax, you can't relax. It be, it goes from like this, the the, the chart of like sort of uh, tension relative to energy within the human body. It it stays on a, it, instead of being a smooth trapezoid, natural harmonic trapezoid, it is like the fucking hockey stick and everything else associated with the consistent class society. It's a straight fucking uh, 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 what's the fucking word people love to use? Uh, it zips up. When you have a thing going up, and then it just goes up way faster. And that's the thing. It's traject... No, it's not that. It. God damn it. Exponential. That's the word I was looking for. I said at the exact same time that that guy put it in there. Thank you. Exponential. Oh! Because the closer you get to it actually being close, and th remember, this is all you experiencing your body. Do you, go, do you experience the pains of aging? As, oh yeah, uh, you know, I'm in a body, but that's fine. Or are they experienced as, Jesus Christ, this thing, this shell of mine is rotting. And how am I going to let go? Looking back on a life where I never felt that I was uh, moving towards anything. I've only ever felt like I've been hiding And that's why old people get go, literally go crazy one way or the other. And our political uh, situation, 
where we have this uh, total absence of any real uh, political conflict. Like, there is no terrain of political change in this country. There is a single party carrying out a, at this point, automated process of stripping the state to keep the uh, uh, the global su uh, capitalist supply chain going. That's it. It's the final cannibal stage. But we have this frenzied, nearly apocalyptic politics generated by these two political parties who exist essentially to entertain old people. That's the job of political parties, to provide a form of entertainment for people who, because they feel that they're dying and they can't process it, need something that's going to keep them energized and activated. Because what they can't live with is the silence. What they can't live with is the pause, which is what is approaching us all. It is silence, but not blackness, which is what the materialist frets about. Because that can't be perceived any more than totality can be perceived. What can be perceived is the trajectory towards it. The feeling of being captured basically like a, a beam of light spiraling into a black hole, which elongates matter. Which means that death is an encounter with eternity that the human mind, trained to... Uh, crouch around a single concept, a very sh shallow and fragile concept of identity and, and, and personality and individuality, cannot confront. It's like the, uh, if anyone's read the Stephen King story, The, the Jaunt, about, inter about uh, teleportation. And if you go through teleportation while well, you're conscious, you experience eternity and then you come back into your body and you're an insane person or you die immediately. That is it. But we don't go insane or become husks like in that short story because we don't come back to our bodies because our bodies are gone. The, the door has been shut. But they got to go somewhere. And what we do is we dream about our lives as we are centripetally pulled towards this thing that we can't deal with and that we pull away from. That is what this is. And we experience heaven, we experience hell, not as permanent states, but as uh, subjective experiences of uh, moving towards something. Heaven is moving towards that sense, that lived, that felt sense of infinite and, and everything and the godliness, everything, but Brahman, whatever you want to call it. But we can't stick there because we have we live complicated lives and we largely don't ever really have a chance to come to terms with any of the people in our lives that we really hurt. Especially now because, my God, who are we talking about? Are we talking about people we know in our lives or are we talking about people who like did slave labor to make our clothing and, and you know, uh, and uh, animals that are massacred to provide our lifestyle? You know, like... There are so many potential people that we would have to deal with that we never get a chance to, that in that infinite, they all get a chance to pop up. We get to confront everybody in our mind that we ever left feeling unreconciled to. And then that process of being re reconciled back to them pulls us towards this inexorable black hole and bounces us back and forth from heaven to hell as we repel as we throw ourselves away from this thing that we cannot accept. Either we can't accept viscerally the black hole, the annihilation, because to be conscious is to not, is to be not that. It's just like, and, and, and that's, that's pulling us away. Uh, but then we're pushed away uh, from uh, totality by our inability to hold that. Because to hold on to individuality, to hold on to a, into a personality, 
with this, this absurdly tiny little vessel of this infinite sea of possibility, it explodes it, it shatters it. So I think we do experience heaven and hell the way that the Buddhists describe it. I, I think that the that Buddhism really does like nail it in terms of describing the subjective experience. And so we have fantasies where we reconcile everything on our terms, and we have nightmares where everything goes the wrong way. And I don't even think that hell is feeling physical pain, because there's only so much physical pain that you yourself can inflict on yourself, uh, because you will you'll flick away from it instinctively. That's what's pulling you away from reconciliation. You know, it's all part of one reflex that we've trained ourselves to spend after spending a lifetime alienated from everyone else and ourselves. That, that, that closed fist that we are that won't let go, even though if it let go, all of the accumulated miseries, all the accumulated disappointments and uh, blame, sense of shame, sense of resentment and desire to, uh, to get revenge, all that stuff, all that unfinished business it doesn't uh, get obliterated. It, it, it gets resolved. You get to feel it resolve. But your body is rebelling. So you can't get that immediate jump off to, uh, to Nirvana. So we're pulling away, we're pulling towards, we're, we're resisting this thing that if we did let go, we would be able to, everything we're seeking is already there if we let go, but we can't, not be, and we can't choose not to, because as I said, this is a instinctive act that the reptilian mind is doing to protect itself, to keep going. A mind could override that, but it would take a lifetime of focus. This, this is the people who are at the end of the, of their cycle, who end up you know, ascending to nirvana because they were lucky enough to be born into a situation where their lives are not traumatized away from being able to do that, being able to spend their time focusing on their body, listening to their body, breathing consciously, embodying themselves. That is a luxury to be able to do that. We don't get to do that. So our brain is going to keep fighting away, even though it does, even though it doesn't have to, even though this is all unnecessary pain. Everything you were afraid of happening will be made ridiculous, would be made instantly hilarious, if there could be a let go. But it, it's just going to have to run itself out. It's going to have to just the energy is going to have to disperse itself, which means you're going to have to run through a bunch of uh, uh, nightmares and fantasies. And eventually, though, I think this is where uh, uh, reincarnation comes in. Because again, when you're, what I'm saying is, at the very end of this journey, you are you are accessing accessing eternity, unbounded, complete, all encompassing consciousness. And your the deepest connections are to that. Like when we're born, we have an infinite capacity that gets chipped away and shaped by our experience over time. And we're back there. So we're going to re-experience everything that we have experienced. We're going to keep resolving it because we have literally forever to do this. And so this search for somewhere to settle, for this energy to settle in the real world means eventually somewhere in space and time, and that I do not know, somewhere in space and time, uh, it reaccumulates around a given set of experiences and a given uh, physiology. It, it's, it's, a it's, a, it's a pattern recognition. A, a, a pattern of energy, a residual pattern of energy left by a life reasserting itself in the physical world at another place in time.
And those experiences keep popping through time and space until they land in that Goldilocks zone where you can live, come into uh, 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 a sense of self, a sense of armorness, live with it, and then uh, reflect on it. And in so doing, come come to that point of death that defines us, as Heidegger says, uh, and, and fully embrace uh, and consciously carry out the process of riding that consciousness spark back to its source. And I would posit, this is my own suspicion, that in that moment, when that mind encounters that infinite sweep, part of the process of its reconciliation is a remembering of every experience that came before. Not just the, la the last life at the end of the chain, but every one before, which includes all of us. And that is the moment of Christian resurrection. So that is why I think you really can say that every religion is true because they all provide the uh, symbolic furniture that we rearrange in our minds to make sense of our experiences. So that means Christ is seen, Christ is encountered, Lucifer, uh, all the folk devils of, uh, of Japanese and Chinese uh, uh, peasant society, uh, Thor, all those guys, everything is real. It's aliens, because when I think about myself, I'm like, well, how, how is this all going to be reflected to me? And I just can't imagine it's going to be Jesus coming through the door like the fucking Kool-Aid man, because I've never believed in him. I, I, I encountered him symbolically, but I never had a belief. Uh, I think people who like fell away from a cr real Christian belief will eventually, at some point in this process, come back to it. Just tidal gravity. But I never believed in it. So that makes me think, maybe for me it would be aliens, you know? Or a future human civilization. Because I really do, even though I, I, I've never believed in Jesus, I do and have believed in the, uh, the secular continuation of the Christian notion of, our, of, uh, of apocalyptic revelation. That is socialism. And so, like, what that belief is, is a belief in the human capacity to create a social organism that brings us back, which is, I think, what Christianity is a response to. Christianity is a response to uh, emerging in a deeply, uh, deeply, deeply rooted slave society that poisons every social relationship that it, is, that it generates because of that. And to be a member of a people, the Jews, who had held to a, a socially organic sense of themselves for, for centuries, and were in, he was in the process of it being stripped away by being dominated by the Roman Empire. All of a sudden, our, our, our holy men are these Pharisees, are these fraudulent uh, crooks who live to keep us loyal to the Roman Empire. Compradors. We got money changers in the temples. Soon there will be no Jews left. And G. Christ, like Trotsky, came to the conclusion, well then, let's make everybody Jewish. Let's extend this pact outward so that we could all live socially organically on a large scale with uh, productive forces that have been accumulated. That is just what socialism, that is Marxism, that is the teleology of, uh, that is inherent, and even if you want to say Marxism isn't teleological or Hegel isn't teleological, 
if you, if it can happen within the context of it, it doesn't matter how much you disavow it actually happening. If it can, then the possibility of it structures your relationship to the concept. So that means that socialism is as teleological as Christianity and a continuation of Christianity's teleology. So that means I'm a Christian. Because I have... I, I conceptually understand the mandala, the cycle, the giving away of the self and the abol abolition of the self and the willing abolition of the self over time. But I am at the end of five of, of at this point, 2,000 years of capital accumulation under a regime that has formally taken the, the concept of Christianity, the, the religious notion of universal brotherhood, and has for 2,000 years put it to the service of slave political economy, where, 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 where uh, instead of the person being a transcendent human category that we are all part of, and that all, every eye reflects itself, instead humanity is proportional to property held. That is a fundamentally schizophrenic social order, and it has schizophrenic social uh, products. Look at what the last 2,000 years have been. Constant, constant warfare. Endless, constant, monstrous warfare that has only over time gotten worse as technology has accumulated around conflict. We like to think of uh, our scientific and technological advancement has been a bunch of cool uh, uh, science epic for the wind nerds sitting around and thinking about things and having apples fall on their head? No. The Once again, human minds coalesce in reaction to things, and scientific and technological innovation reacts to war. War is it. Then, to fight the war, we think up stuff to do a better job of killing one another with. We just did the Hell of Presidents, that's, or Hell on Earth, that's the thesis of Hell on Earth, essentially. And why is that? Because we are divided against ourselves. We're sick. It is a sick social order. And because we are, our individual little boat is totally diametrically opposed to the good long-term best interests of people around us and the planet we live on. But that doesn't mean that Christianity isn't true. It has to be because it, it did all that. The same way that capitalism is now a, a religion, that it is a god, that it emerged out of uh, Christianity and, and overtook it, uh, socially uh, hollowed out Christianity, replaced it with itself, like one of those, uh, uh, one of those lizards like eats eggs out of a out of a, a nest and then uh, comes out and eats the bird when they, when they when they're birds and so this thing will just keep smashing against itself until it is annihilated because it cannot reconcile itself well with Christianity and socialism uh, theorizes that through the social control of technology at an advanced level, uh, human, uh, the human uh, consciousness that is able to do that is able to reformulate an understanding of it of self-interest and the interests of others and the interests of the planet that aligns them once again that pulls us back into harmony pulls us back into socially uh, uh, into social socially. I had the word earlier. Organic social structures, I guess I mean. And I think this is the fundamental distinction. This is the this is the real div divide in belief, fundamental fundamental belief uh, in the West 
is do you believe that that's possible? Somewhere, anywhere. Not even here, not even with the humans we have on Earth at this current moment. Do you believe that it is in some world made up of human motherfucking beings possible to do that? Or you don't. And that is the distinction between left and right to my mind. And for me, the, the evidence of my senses, my emotional and uh, empirical senses, is such that the uh, motive force of, of belief is so overwhelming that, that miracles, the, the otherwise materially inconceivable, uh, are not just possible, but necessary for the creation of human society of any kind. And so now the right, the right wing in the West here is we understand that, oh, like the doors are closed. There's nobody at the wheel. The, the, the oceans are rising. Like this is not going to come together. And if you're a reactionary, we're not going to get to a point. Uh, uh, well, that's the thing is the reactionary uh, desire is an anti-rational urge to plunge towards the abyss. A self-conscious desire to plunge into the abyss, uh, with having forsaken the hope of being elevated to being reconciled. Uh, instead, the, the gaze is turned downward. Satan is turned into God. And that is the, the, the uh, uh, warrior pagan heart of Christianity uh, that sits side by side uh, with the Jewish one. Because Christianity is functionally this overlaying of Abrahamic religious traditions on a European pagan warrior culture. Uh, Varg talks about this all the time. Uh, and the hope there is that you will, uh, you choose barbarism consciously, and then in becoming a barbarian, you regain that sense of purpose and harmony with nature that the barbarians had. But again, what they fail to point recognize is that you don't have a warrior society anymore. You have a technologically reproduced class society. You don't have the closeness to the world. You don't have, you don't have the the ear to hear the heart of the earth beating, the way that a pagan warrior did. You do, you that that road has been burned. That experience is not accessible to you. You cling to a ghost. Yeah, the Jew, uh, uh, Jewish Judaism started as a warrior pagan cult too. You, the fucking whole Bible is just them killing people and owning other tribes, but they're doing it as a tribe, not as a collection of warriors who are showing each other who's the best. And it's because the Jews weren't very good at being warriors. I mean, Judaism is a adaptation to getting your ass kicked. If, if you win, you don't have to do something as radical as redefine what God means. And say, God is not nature. God is humans distinct from nature. It wouldn't occur to you if you were winning some battles once in a while. So the Jews are basically the indoor kids. And that is why the, the right wing is inherently anti-Semitic. Because to them, this is the essential lie that was whispered into the ears of the white race. Uh, that this kind of reconciliation is possible. But of course, the, the, the racial identity that they uh, fantasize about is an artifact of capitalism. It's an artifact of the very alienation that they think they're trying to abolish. The only way out is through. So that means, what am I going to encounter in, in my in my uh, movement towards this this totality, this experience of totality? Uh, there'll probably be aliens. Jesus will probably show up at some point, uh, and then there will be other lives. 
here on Earth, somewhere else, as human, as a different species, as a, as a, as a tentacle man? But somewhere along the line, one of those people is going to die having experienced a, a technologically uh, facilitated access to subjective infinity. And that once that's achieved, it reflects backward and through all of consciousness and all of existence, which are the same thing. Because as I said, we do not experience the world. We experience a mentally projected hologram of the world. And our experience of life is all of those holograms bumping into each other. And because we grow into a below conscious belief in the world that we're seeing. We act like that's true. We could reform it all tomorrow. Like that's that's the thing. That's why people are drawn to idealist conceptions of history because we do have the capacity, the theoretical capacity to redefine our relationship to our environment so radically that it would be miraculously uh, unrecognizable to anyone living now. But we would all have to move towards that uh, same goal at the same time, which we can't do. So we have to live bumping into each other, echolocating off one another, which creates, in effect, a, materialist, a material framework that defines and guides all of our actions. And that is what suggests that there is a um, no no free will. That that understanding is what makes us think, oh, it's just billiard balls hitting each other. And the thing is, yeah, it is. There are a bunch of billiard balls hitting each other. But once you have conscious beings who live in that gap between an event happening and their mental projection of that event, and they get to fill in causality. Uh, instinctively and, and unconsciously, but self-directedly and motivated by not what is really going on, but what they want to be true. That means we are living in not the world of our bodies and, and the world around and the objects around us, but in a mutually agreed upon uh, matrix. Like, that's the thing. No shit we live in the matrix. But there is nobody programming it we are all programming it it is a self-reproducing matrix so that means consciousness is by definition free will because it is a it is action out of ignorance it is action out of uh, desire subconscious desire, remember, there's a subconscious desire. So you're talking death drive, you're talking all this stuff that we wouldn't in our minds think is why we why we are doing what we're doing, how we're reacting the way we're reacting. We're having emotional responses to what we encounter, and those emotional responses are colored by our projection, our, our desire in the situation. So we live together in this thing that is a map, mapped on the world, mapped on the objects, mapped on our bodies, but is also separate. And death is so traumatizing to think about because it is the mind re-entering the body. It is that hovering hologram world refusing with a body that is not acting for the reasons you think it is that is 
actually doing other things. That feeling you're feeling, this is why you felt that. You didn't know, but now you do, finally. But it's too late to do anything about it. Except, accept it. Accept, let it happen. But our bodies won't let us, again. Because they're, they're living in this world where the assumption is that we are separate. The assumption is that I have an interest that is different than the interests of others. But dialectical materialism is the, the yearning for a world made at some point out of real material that allows people to be born into life, born into individuality and the sense of self, encounter others, and use their energies to their fullest positive use while they have them. And then to die in the process, or if they don't, to live long enough to reflect backward into this uh, reconciliation. And if you have a society where everyone gets to have that experience, then the collective experience of those people dying projects retroactively into all consciousness this light that we are all being animated by. And that's why we can't have AI because what makes consciousness is stakes. What makes consciousness is mortality. It is vulnerability. It's what makes want. It's what makes desire. And then we carry out a life of those desires. And our thinking is motivated by satisfying those desires. The computer can't do that. The computer cannot be made to feel those things. You would have to do, you would have to create a robot. It would, it would have to have like sensory inputs that gave it a sense of separation, that, that cut off somewhere and that gave it power over its movements. Like that would have to, it could not just be a program. Because that is what builds consciousness, is that grasping towards something. Because, as I said, if you've got access to everything, you can only be in harmony with that if you don't want anything. If you don't, because anything has to be pulled out of the morass of anything, right? A specific thing. And that is why uh, our lives are this accumulation of thwarted desires that then consume us as we get older, drive us into mania and, and hatred of our fellow and a desire to just smash everything. If it's got to end, let it end now before I have to worry about, about having to face consequences. Because that's, that's the suburban boomer death drive of the right. They're all afraid of MS-13 and, and, uh, and ISIS coming and cutting their heads off because they know deep down they have it coming. And they want, they want it to happen. They want to be destroyed by another where they could be a victim. They do not want to be put face to face with their actions in life. Nobody does. Because we're pushed before we even know it into lives of subservience or domination. That if we are able to come into real alienation from, it's already too late because we've lost the religious capacity to... Ritually reconcile.
And we have to be able to ritually reconcile, to be able to look back at our lives as we're living them and say, this happened, that happened, but I don't need to be punished for it. I don't need to punish somebody else for doing it to me. I forgive and am in turn forgiven. If you can't ritually reaffirm that fact, that truth, and you can't sit and feel with it because you have been made to feel it by an encounter with others, which is how ritual meaning is formed, then you're just going to get have the fist grow tighter and tighter and tighter. And I think that is the centripetal pull that we're all forced to press against. And the boomer and the fascist death drive is the is the desire to just let it go, to just grind, to smash oneself. Because then at least we won't have to ever reckon with the enormity of our sins, which if we cannot be forgiven for, if we if we give away the idea of forgiveness and reconciliation, which reactionary thought is premised on, then we have to just to smash ourselves. But guess what? As I said, you're in there forever. So it's all going to come around. Every 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 death-worshipping fascist who thinks they're going to get out of judgment is sorely mistaken. Because on an eternal plane, you will be rec you will be brought to the other side of every wrong you've ever done. And in finding that experience, you will regret your choices. And since choices are the only thing that the modern consumer subject has, that is the only thing that animates our identity, so whether we're good or bad, not not uh, not choices to you know act well to other people or anything, but choices in the marketplace that determine whether we we consumed a lot or uh, or not, whether we met, got a lot of toys. Or not. Taking away our choices is taking away our, our sense of the world. And we won't let that go easily. But I do think fundamentally everybody, no matter what bad choices they make, no matter how much they, they uh, try to dive into the hell pit, they're going to get spit out eventually because... The thing that's having these fantasies, the brain that's making these projections, as I said, emerges out of a holistically collective relationship. Which means it knows more than our conscious mind or even our reptilian subconscious can. And that after the energy has been released of this exchange, after the unclenching has, has, committed, has uh, commenced, that last gasp, that last little tail, uh, no matter how, you're talking like one one millionth of a second if you were to judge it uh, in uh, 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 medical terms, if you could, if you could, you know, get an mi electron microscope and watch this, this energy transfer occur. But subjectively, who knows? Again, you, you, you're outside of chronology here. It feels like eternity for, for for whatever that feels like. But what most of all it feels like is, is submission. <laughs> and that's why Islam, of course, also correct. Uh, like I don't think we go to hell, but I do I don't think hell is pain. I said that earlier. I think hell is the anticipation of pain. If anybody ever uh, read um, the Hilary Mantel uh, Wolf Hall books about uh, Richard Cromwell, or Thomas Cromwell, sorry. Uh, great book, by the way. Uh, great series of books. It ends, spoiler alert, with Cromwell getting decapitated uh, at the orders of Henry VIII after failing to ride the bull. And it, it's, it's his subjective experience of being beheaded. 
Uh, and in it, right before it happens, he's, ima he's, he, he's, he's imagining what hell will be, and it's, it's, it's his uh, abusive father, but not being beaten by his abusive father, but being somewhere and hearing his abusive father's approaching voice. I think, th and that, we're stuck with that. As modern subjects who have done wrong, I know I've done a lot wrong in my life. I'm very much, I'm very uh, re regretful for. I try to make amends. I don't feel like I've done enough. I hope at some point I will get a chance to do enough. But I know, I know that if a fucking uh, jet engine fell on my head right now, or I had a, a brain uh, aneurysm and dropped dead at this moment, even if there was no physical pain, uh, I would have to. I would make myself suffer for those wrongs, but not eternally. It can't be. That's 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 the loss. That's the um, uh, the learning loss. What do you call it? Uh, the latency that the latency of the transmission from Christ to his followers, and the inherent latency in transmitting in a, a, a context of uh, class society. Now the thing is, I haven't done anything wrong. I did what I I did what I thought at the time was the right thing to do. If I'd had bad consequences, it's because I was angled in the wrong direction. I know that, and I know that I will be forgiven. I forgive myself sometimes, but again, I'm talking deeper than my conscious mind. If it's just if the lights just go out right now, I'm not going to be in charge anymore. My subconscious is going to be in charge, and my subconscious wired to this body, wrapped up. I have tried to de-armor. I have been trying to de-armor. I think I have. It's actually very weird. Like sometimes I will like meditate or something, and then it will feel in my neck like I had a massage. Like I feel like I am decalcifying, but I'm also aware that you know, I'll, oh, like I do have feelings in my body that feel like they could be something else. What if? What if, what if my brain is telling myself that uh, I'm not, you know, that I'm not worse off, that it's hiding something from me? Oh, the world looks like shit. What if everything collapses? What if, what if there's some sort of horrifying disaster? What if the economy falls off a cliff and I'm forced into, uh, you know, living off my, off the land while being a crippled, you know, uh, fat idiot? I, all of that could happen. It all could happen, uh, and that's fine. The way to live with those possibilities, which can't be gotten rid of, is by having, I hate to say the word, but faith. So yeah, I'm going to like be chased by a goblin for a while. I don't know, be in a plane crash, have one of those like experiences of anticipation anticipatory terror that I spend my life that I spent a lot I I'm trying to reduce the amount, but for a long time I spent my life just trying to ignore and repress, literally repress. It's going to happen for a while, but it's fine. There's always a moment when the door opens and a hand emerges because it's all you, which is all us, which is all everything. And it's only really my deep-bred cowardice, which, I mean, once again, I can't blame myself too much because I did have this extraordinarily absurd spinal injury when I was in high school that left me partially paralyzed uh, for the rest of my life, like at the moment I was supposed to be an adult, I was already pretty fucking neurotic before that because I told you, like, I started having these thoughts when I was a kid. And that's like your brain trying to send out signals till it hits something. And if it keep, if it doesn't hit anything, it's going to start making monsters. And that's what the lack of ritually reinforced religious belief has done. It's left us just bouncing off until we encounter a, a monster.
because there will be physical experience. There will be like, there are, you're going, your body is going to be sending signals, but those signals only mean what our brain wants them to mean. And this is the process I was talking about of coming into that armoring is we are all navigating good and bad feelings, but what in our body are subjectively understood as good and bad feelings are only encountered through experience. It is not abstract concepts that our brains emerge uh, to represent. It is uh, concrete experiences that are then retrospectively given names and weight and meaning. All right, I hope this has not been totally insane sounding. I mean, I know fundamentally what this is, is I am an ape. I am a big old ape that has been possessed by this symbolic order. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, out there. I'm haunted by a ghost of words, of symbols that are not real, that are not my body, that are not my, uh, my material experience. Uh, that are only a reflection of them, are not connected, are a reflection of. And I have to exercise them. We all have to exercise these fucking ghosts, these thetans. <laughs> and for me, like, I spend a lot of my time still, and I know it's like, it's because, you know, as much as I, I want to live a certain way, it's it's hard for me to do because everything is at cross purposes. But I feel less crossed up than I ever have. And when I look at why, it's because of things like this. It is This is literally what does it. it is It is untangling a mental knot that has emerged out of my brain trying to make sense of my body and the world around me. And more than anything... Make its peace with finitude because my body is very finite and only getting more finite. And the society that I live in we're both we're all sick. Sickness defines us as 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 a uh, project. And to bring it back to what I was saying the other week about the apocalypse having happened and the Satan having won is that that teleology I talked about that has animated uh, the moral center of humanity since the time of Christ uh, has been materially extinguished. We're not, we're not going to get the dream of Christ, and Trot, Marx, and Trotsky, which is a Western tradition birth, uh, born out of the experience of uh, the, uh, the Jewish people in the Near East, encompassing eventually all of humanity in a process of unfolding revelation. We've had the revelations, but we folded away. And that's because of the roll of the dice. We got a landmass where something like capitalism could pop up to fully alienate and dominate and technologically absorb humanity. Yeah, the Jehovah's Witnesses say, oh, Christianity was uh, hijacked. Yes, it was. That is correct. It was. When you take a religion of, of, uh, of, po of, uh, of universal brotherhood, poverty, and you turn it into a justification for a regime of slave power, you have created a new religion. And then, but the thing is, there's still that peasant heart to it. There's that, the experience of like being a member of a church and getting real absolution through social encounter that is at the heart of all societies, at least it was. 
some Christianity, real Christianity, lived at the, and, 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 and thrived and became things like all, all the religious uh, 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 reformatory movements within Catholicism. The fucking Albigensians, the Bogomils, the Lollards, all culminating in Reforma the Reformation. But all they could really do, because they could not confront class, was build a new idol, a more effective uh, satanic regime. So we're not going to get that. But that does not mean that uh, consciousness will not eventually become totalized in the material world. It just means that this group of people, this civilizational pod, isn't going to do it. That realization is the first step towards meaningful social and political action. Because it strips us of our ego attachment to change. And that is why I don't think that you're going to resurrect any of these Christian structures to, to be liberatory. Uh, the, the, the trad calf thing is a dead end, obviously. It's just a, it's a pretentious mask for... The, the nihilistic, uh, anti-rational desire to resubmerge re into the the, the uh, into the pagan uh, warrior oblivion. Can we have human meaning without an other? Can we build human meaning without a uh, the specter of an other? That's the question. Uh, and I think it really is a Plato's cave deal. Like the, the reactionary desire, which is motivated by people who want this to be true because it allows them to sit on their fucking hoarded wealth and it allows them to get meaning out of violence and sadism. And that goes all the way down. Like, people who are suffering and want this want it because they get to fucking punish somebody for their suffering. And they want to feel good that way. It's a belief that, no, what it means to be human is uh, can only give be given uh, shape and substance by that conflict with another. Uh, I believe that only in the absence of that other can real human subjectivity deeper, I guess I should say, a deeper human subjectivity be, be achieved. And it would be horrifying and inhuman uh, to the, uh, the reactionary, but it's only because it involves giving up their armored and illusory sense of self. Okay. So I hope that was not totally insane. But I do think that is what happens. And I do... When I talk about this stuff, I do feel a real sense of liquidity. In my body, I feel, Im I feel embodied. And I think that is what we're all seeking. This is the... Subjective experience I'm talking about, of being like gloved within a, a, a stream of, of action, guided uh, in a way that is reinforcing across all uh, levels of consciousness, rather than punching against. So that's why I keep doing it. Catharsis is the word we're looking for. Now, again, because I have forever because my mind can move very fast no matter what I'm doing, I can question that and say, well, what if the, what you're really talking about is uh, coping with a hopeless situation? You're essentially doing su subconscious hospice. Like, you are winding down way faster than you think, and you're actually going to just keel over any day now, or 
couple months, couple weeks, within the near time, relatively near time frame. And this is your subconscious's way of uh, easing you into it. The beauty part of what I just described over the last hour and 20 minutes is that if that worst theory, my worst fear is true, oh, what if that's what you're doing? It overlaps entirely on everything else I just said. So then there's nothing to fear. But I'm still in a decaying body, you know? I still am, con I'm literally always receiving pain signals from my legs at every second I'm alive. I'm uh, aging. I'm, 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 I am at the point where you start going down. You start losing your juice. Things are starting to unravel, and I'm feeling that. And that those feelings have to be uh, subjectively experienced and made sense of. And that is what this ritual reaffirmation of religion I'm talking about serves to do. It serves to ch allow for moments of charged uh, reaffirmation of belief in a course of action so that you can carry one out. So that leaves me here. Maybe the entire banking structure collapses over the next three weeks and uh, living in a Hooverville a month from now, that's fine. Even if that's less pleasurable, it is no less a terrain of struggle. And it's no less a place to uh, a zone of choice and action and a uh, opportunity to deeply align one's uh, interests with the greater world. But you know, okay, the other alternative, everything goes great and I live a long time. Well, everything is going to get bad everywhere else. I'm going to be aloof from it and in implicated in it. How, how will I deal with that? Well, at some point, keeping that harmony is going to come into play and choices are going to have to be made. And faith is faith in uh, the ultimate connection between all levels and planes of perception and reality. And to me, that is not a religious... I mean, I have a hard time. I've always had a hard time with religious faith because I was this inert uh, ball of neuroses. And to have, like, genuine religious experiences, your eyes have to be up a little bit. And mine were always down. But one way or another, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to experience pain, even though I know it's unnecessary, even I know I, I know that, that, that all, all burdens could be dropped. The, 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 the cage of flesh is going to still push me through experiences of suffering, and that that suffering will have to be unraveled over millennia. But I just can't get over the fact that eventually we are all the residue of our lives in a sea of infinity. And at some point, the illusory subjective barrier between those things has to break down. Again, don't have to get religious. Thermo thermodynamically required to break down. And if that is a subjective experience, which I think it has to be, because that's the only that's the only thing there is, and it and it cannot and it cannot encompass death. Shit, there really isn't anything to be afraid of. Of course, what does that have to do with the price of eggs? What does that have to do with getting up in the morning and finding meaning? That is an annoyingly separate question.
And even if we get captured in a cycle, that cycle will break down no matter how long it takes. It has to. All cycles break down. All energy is dispersed. And we are gathered and then dispersed energy. That's all we are. And if life is a subjective experience, then we are the subjective experience of infinity, of, of, of all of the only meaningful word for God, or the only meaningful definition of God. All right. Well, there you go. Take that with you. Do whatever you want with it. Call, uh, call in a 5150 for me. Let's see what happens. I don't know. Take it easy. That is, that really is all I can say. Oh, God. Take it easy. But as Terrence McKenna said, uh, take it easy, but take it. Bye.